How's that? Yeah. All right, so um, today I want to tell a couple stories, and then I have a question. Before we get down to it, let's uh, close our eyes and say a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this time to be with us today. Thank you for the wonderful weather that you sent us. Um, In my life, I've often had a kind of a, a, is a question that I face a number of times. So how many of you guys have heard of, of fight or flight? You know, so when we're in a, how many of you guys, uh, if you're in a, in, a, in a difficult situation, your first instinct is flight? And how many of you, it is fight? So I saw one hand. <laughs> Um, a lot of my friends, their first instinct when, when uh, things get tense, they're like, what's happening here? You know, I have some very good friends who I, I know for a fact that they've been love charged by grizzlies and their, their instinct was to charge with that and they've done it. Um, whereas for me, um, there's also the third option, freeze. And uh, for me, I tend to freeze when I'm in a stressful situation. But in amongst this impression of fight or flight or freeze, there's always this question of how do I respond when, when things get difficult? When if someone comes up to me and things start to get tense and I'm, I'm being pressured, what is the right amount to push back? What is the right amount to defend myself? Uh, how far do I go with defending myself? I know as, a, as an organization or as a community, historically been pacifist, which means that we have not participated in warfare, and for a lot of us that's, maybe that's translated into our day-to-day -day activity, and we, we, we all have the other uh, This is the I've always had a has been to sort of pretend whatever's going on is not going on or just sort of ignore things until they get better. And uh, there's been definitely been times in my life where I felt that the right situation should have been some sort of pushback. And I say this because in the Bible, we have a lot of examples of people, you know, people giving very good examples of all these responses. And today we're going to be looking at, in part, uh, one of the most interesting ones in the Bible, and that is when Jesus chose to fight. So uh, if you want to turn your Bibles, it's in John chapter 2. So, in this story, this is the, the second, uh, Jesus has just kind of done his first miracle. You know, his first disciples have sort of followed him, he's having some people listening to what he is saying, and in his first time in his ministry, he's gone to Jerusalem after turning water into wine. And if we read, it says, it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. You know, so this was the seat of the temple where everybody went to worship. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered the prophecy from scriptures, passion for God's house will consume him. 
But Jesus, but Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Um, what, they exclaimed, is taking 46 years to build this temple, and you can just build it in just three days? But when Jesus said, this temple is made his own body, uh, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Now, when we think about the teachings of Jesus, we often think about love, and turn the other cheek, and as much others do, have yet one to you. Yet here we have a story where Jesus makes a whip and drives uh, a number of people out of the temple. He drives all the animals, everything out of the temple. And um, I wish I could remember the verse. I should have looked it up earlier where it says, uh, um, what is it? you have made it into a den of thieves when you have raised the temple. Um, I'll look that one after I finish. But uh, this started me on a long kind of chain of thought and I realize it's related very closely to a number of the stories and, and the discussions that I've been having with a lot of my students over the past few weeks. So, um, as you guys know, I'm a school teacher, and so, and I and I tend to go from class to class. So, in, in, in uh, part of my teaching, I get to visit most of the classes. There are certain ages, and certain ages, and certain times of their lives have a harder time than others getting over. Um, you know, usually, uh, just as kids are reaching puberty and turning, you have to go. 13. Some classes find life to be very stressful. They find each other to be very stressful. They respond by poking at each other or bullying each other or um, really just trying to push every boundary imaginable. And uh, it doesn't do wonders for their social lives. And, and, and it's kind of a hard thing for them. Like they're trying to figure out how do we. Make friends, what's the right way to respond to the relationship? So, so, one of the things that I do in my work is I try to provide these kids with tools that will let them think about what they do before they do it. It's kind of a long shot, but I figure if we work at it for a few years, eventually they'll all survive. Um, and if I'm really lucky, I might survive them as well. Uh, I'm not sure about their future. But, uh, so, one of a lot of the stories that I look for are stories that deal with why a person might um, that deal with reasons why a person might choose to defend themselves. A person why I might uh, how do we get into encounters with each other? How do we treat each other when we are uh, encountering each other? How do we avoid conflict? And one of the stories I tell, I want to share with you guys now. Um, actually, let's see. Do I want to pull that one first? Yeah. So, there's a story about a, a man who lived at a Cascade Inlet out on the coast here. He was, uh, he was supposed to be the first man to ever live in this area. And uh, he had quite a nice place where he lived. He had uh, a large orchard of wild crab apples. He had a fish weir that he'd go out and get fish every day. He had a nice house. He had a nice garden growing along the seashore. Um, with his uh, carrot, you know, wild carrots, and uh, the different kinds of coastal guardians. He had his clam beds and all of these things there. And it was really a very nice place to live. And, uh, you know, it took a bit of work. He would have to be burning his charcoal and, and seaweed and, and fertilizing his gardens. And he'd have to go and harvest his clams. And he'd have to go do repair work on his rock weirs where he caught his fish. And of course, his, his uh, apple orchard needed a little bit of defending from the odd bear and had to be harvested. And pruned, but it was a very nice place. And one day a man came uh, to the area and saw everything that this man had. Now, before I go further, I would say that uh, when we get into conflict with each other, um, all of us have rules. Like we have ways that we that you know, if, if I'm mad with Opa and Opa's mad with me, um, step one, we talk about it. Step two. You know, how, how many steps down the, the line does it come to where we're both holding knives and trying to stab each other? It's, it's a lot of steps. And that's because we have conventions. We have we have ways that prevent us from going that far because it's not good for us if we start harming each other. And so this man who came to visit, uh, uh, but if I don't know somebody, and they come and they start trying to rob me, um, I don't necessarily first begin by a calm discussion as to why they're robbing me. I, I might go several steps higher right off the bat. 
And so this man who came to the house of Kasana, um, he began by helping Kasana, this man uh, who lived in Cascade, doing everything that he did. He would help him work on his beer, he would help him with his garden, he would help him uh, packing rocks, he would help him picking apples, he would help him with firewood, and for several months he helped this guy. And so um, Kasana considered this man a friend. Um, at this point, this man decided to abuse his friendship, and he said, Hey, Kasana, I don't think uh, you really deserve all of this stuff that you have here. I think that it should be mine. In fact, I'm going to challenge you to a wrestling match for it. Um, and uh, now, if someone walked up to me and said, I'm going to wrestle you for your house, I would say, no, thank you. But, uh, you know, at a certain point... Uh, you know, because they were friends, the guy said, I'm going to fight you for it. Well, they decided to do it in the form of wrestling, which has rules. You don't just be wrestling somebody and then suddenly pull out a knife, for example. It's, it's a way that because we have a relationship, because we have some sort of trust, because we have a reputation that we value, um, we're able to solve a problem in a way that doesn't get people hurt. And so Kasana, the owner of this place, was like, well... This isn't really the you that I know, but because you're my friend, okay. So they got together, and, and I should say that in this story, the Kasana only has one leg. And so the man who had visited was saying, I can beat this man in a wrestling match easy. Well, of course, what happened is they wrestled, and the new man lost. And he said, you cheated, I know you cheated. And he said, oh, all right, let's wrestle again. So they wrestled the second time, and the man lost again. And he continued to say, you cheated, you cheated. At which point, Kasana lost all of his respect for this man who he had thought was his friend and realized that he didn't really have to treat him all that well anymore, and he threw him out into the water, where this man who's, uh, in this story, was actually Raven, a trickster character, uh, then uh, landed in the water and had to kind of flap away to the shore and never came back because he had worn out his welcome. And, uh, you know, and this is kind of a story of, of the work this, you know, Raven did, Quach did, to, to, to build the relationship that he could then exploit. And so in my students, we would discuss, like, what is it that you can do to build relationships with your friends? And so in our discussions, people would say things like, well, if I brought muffins for all of my friends, that would help things. And everyone's like, yeah, you should do that. Or if I talk to my friends, that would be nice things. Or if I don't be mean to them. Or, like, so people, people have these ideas as to how you can do this. But the, the, the second part is that you, know, you have to have that consistency. You can't build a relationship and then turn around and exploit it. Now... There's a story very similar to this in the Bible that I really enjoy. This is the story of uh, Laban and Jacob. Now, Jacob, in the Old Testament, the son of uh, Isaac, is one of the very, you know, the real, we talk about him as a trickster figure in the Bible. But when you start looking at it, he's not just a, a trickster character who's always trying to trick people. Um, just reading this story, I realize that I, it's, it's really a very clear telling of his life's ups and downs. And he's, he's a person who... who doesn't know whether he should be dealing straightforward with a person or if he should be trying to get, get his own with him. You know, so if you've ever had people that, uh, you know, for years you tried to be the best person you could with them and then all of a sudden they just betrayed you and now you're like, well, do I continue to try and be the person I want to be with them or should I, do I no longer have any obligation to them? Should I try to trick them as well? And, and Jacob is going through these challenges. So this takes place just after Jacob has tricked his brother Esau so badly that Esau now wants to kill him. And, and, and Jacob has used the excuse of wanting to find a wife to leave his father and travel in fear of his life to a new place where, as, as I read it, Jacob is looking for new beginnings. Jacob is trying to leave his life of trickery, his life of like conflict with his brother. He is leaving everything behind. He is leaving his inheritance behind. He is leaving all of his father's wealth behind. Um, he's not fighting for the wealth. What he's fighting for is a, is a place where he can again be the person that he admired his dad for being. He can again be the person that he, he wants to be. And so if we turn to Genesis 29, uh, I think it's right here. Genesis 29... Yeah. So Jacob has just had his experience where he's met God and God's, uh, he's seen the angels going up and down on the ladder and it's, it's uh, at Bethel, 
Jacob was on the fleeing and he slept with a rock as a pillow and he had a vision of God giving him a promise that he would take care of him. So I feel like Jacob is in a very good place right now. Jacob is feeling like he's going to be the person that God wants him to be. And it says, Then Jacob hurried on, finally arriving in the land of the east. He saw a well in the distance. Three flocks of sheep and goats lay in an open field beside it, waiting to be watered. But a heavy stone covered the mouth of the well. It was the custom there to wait for all the flocks to arrive before removing the stone and watering the animals. Afterward, the stone would be placed back over the mouth of the well. Jacob went over to the shepherds and asked, Where are you from, my friends? We are from Haran, they answered. Do you know a man there named Laban, grandson of Nahor? Yes, we do, they replied. Is he doing well? Jacob asked. Yes, he's well, they answered. Look, here comes his daughter's daughter Rachel with the flock now. Jacob said, Look, it's still broad daylight, too early to round up the animals. Why don't you water the sheep and goats so they can get back out to pasture? Um, we can't water the animals until all the flocks have arrived, they replied. Then the shepherds move the stone from the mouth of the well, and we water all the sheep and goats. Jacob was still talking with them when Rachel arrived with her father's flock, for she was a shepherd. And because Rachel was his cousin, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and because the sheep and goats belonged to his uncle Laban, Jacob went over to the well and moved the stone from its mouth and watered his uncle's flock. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and he wept aloud. He explained to Rachel that he was her cousin on her father's side, the son of her aunt Rebecca. So Rachel quickly ran and told her father, Laban. So I'll just pause here for a second. In my mind, this is like Jacob is being very emotional. He's feeling like he's just left all of this danger and this confusion behind him. And now he's found family. It's his uncle. It's his cousin. He's like just, he's crying. He's so relieved to finally have a home again. And in my mind, I don't see Jacob here looking as to how he can trick somebody. Um, as soon as Laban heard that his nephew had arrived, he ran out to meet him. He embraced and kissed him and brought him home. When Jacob told him his story, Laban exclaimed, you really are my own flesh and blood. So again, he's welcoming in, him in and trying to establish a family relationship. After Jacob had stayed with Laban for about a month, Laban said to him, you shouldn't work for me without pay just because we are relatives. Tell me how much your wages should be. So again, he's trying to be honest with him, be upright with him, not take advantage of him. And this is how Jacob feels it. He's feeling like he's in a place where um, his family is there for him and they're not trying to take advantage of him and he can just relax and work and be himself and everything's going to be good. Now, it goes on to say that Laban had two daughters, and Jacob fell in love with the one daughter, Rebekah, and said, I will work for you for seven years if you give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. Uh, Agreed, Laban replied. I would rather give her to you than to anyone else. Stay and work with me. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel, but his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but a few days. You know, so I, I really think, yes, Yes. Yeah. <coughs> but it seemed like a moment because he was so much in love. That might seem backwards. I don't know. Let's see. So, yeah, here's a seven-year period or longer where Jacob is, is just working hard and feeling happy and secure in his new family. And then we have the change. Finally, the time came for him to marry her. I have fulfilled my agreement, Jacob said to Laban. Now give me my wife so I can sleep with her. Very, very clear. So Laban invited everyone to the, in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. But that night when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob and he slept with her. When Jacob woke up, woke up in the morning, it was Leah. What have you done to me, Jacob raged at Laban. I worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? You know, so he didn't see this trickery coming he felt that there was some honesty, some real connection between them. And Laban replied, it is not our custom here to marry off a younger daughter instead of the firstborn. But wait until the bridal week is over, then we'll give you Rachel too, provided you promise to work another seven years for me. So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. Now, the story goes on for the next few chapters, and we find that after this, Jacob, Jacob's firm footing is no longer there. 
um, for, the, for the rest of his time in Haran, in all of his relationships with Laban, it's constantly back and forth trying to trick each other. Jacob try, um, the wages are favoring Jacob, so Laban changes them. And then Jacob does something to make it so that the new, the new wages favor him. And it becomes a tit for tat, trick for trick for trick for trick, right back to where Jacob was before he ever left home. You know, so in all of his hopes to have a new, to be a new person, he was back to his old person right away. And you can see that Jacob's ability to trust Laban and Laban's ability to trust Jacob had both been destroyed. And for them to rebuild that, something really needed to happen. Now, you know, once we lose trust um, with somebody, we can try and build it again, but it's hard. Now, Let's see. When it comes to finding ways to, to help people make those good relationships, to have that good reputation, there's a lot of different things we do. Um, Isaiah and Matthias have heard me tell them a story a few times while we were camping about a, a young woman whose husband sold her as a slave, and uh, she then was lost in the wilderness, and... Uh, while escaping and was discovered by some young men who wanted to bring her home to their community. And in preparation to take this starving, miserable-looking former slave woman to their family, they, they stopped a short ways out of their hometown, and they brought food to her, and they fed her until she looked healthy. They went to the town, and they brought back clothing so that she would look wealthy. And then they arranged for a feast to welcome her when she arrived. So instead of arriving at the town as a as a starving, uh, escaped slave wearing rags in the cold, she arrived looking like a high-ranking, well-respected person, and she then went on to marry into that community and live the rest of her life there. You know, and, and I think uh, you know, this story of things that we do to help people be seen as who they can be or help pave the way or help um, establish our children's reputations are very important. I know that the first few jobs I got were all because people knew my family. Um, I would hear things like, oh, you're a McCreary? Oh, I'll hire you. Because they knew that we worked hard and that we were easy on equipment. Um, you know, I, I hope that it's still true. Uh, and I have uh, suspicions as to how it happened. But really, it was just because people trusted my family that I would get hired. And, and when I go from this, um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. You know, within our community, we all sort of, we, we also have a, a responsibility. We, we want to look at Jesus' life. We want to look at God, look at his character, you know, love, what it means. And we want to, we want to be that personality to the people around us. Um, to help us, uh, we have, God has said he will give us power. Um, we also do our best to help each other. And uh, we also have our education that helps us. We have the stories of the Bible to help us. Uh, and, and between others helping us live up to what we want and God helping us to live up to be who we want to be and us choosing to live who we want to be, um, you know, all of those come together to really give people a lot of support in representing the character that we want to be. But sometimes things happen where... Suddenly, we're, you know, sometimes accusations can happen that can destroy a reputation that a person might have built over years. And, uh, and that can be one of the hardest things to deal with. And so when I, uh, let's see. When, when things happen, all of that work that us, our community, others have done to, to become a person who can be trusted, to become a person who can help people, Sometimes when things happen that destroy others' trust in us, everything that we have worked for can be undone. And in my mind, it seems that this is something that is worth fighting for. Now, let's turn back to another Bible story. Say, God sent a man, you know, and he really wanted him to have every advantage in making an influence in the world. He wanted him to be accepted by the people. Now, he sent people ahead of this man to prepare his way. He sent prophets. He sent stories. 
He prepared a whole book so that people could learn about him coming. And so that when that man came, he could help that, then, then, then that man himself could study it to learn about his mission. You know, Satan tried to stop him. He um, accused him of various things. We had the temptations in the wilderness, but, you know, that man was Jesus, the Son of God. And, and a lot of work went into, you know, his mother and father gave him, tried to give him the best reputation he could have. The prophets told people what to look for. God was careful in his relationship with his people through the ages so the people should know what, this, what he should be. And, and Jesus was there to take that reputation that God had built and take it further. He was supposed to not just kind of say, you guys remember what God's like? That's what I'm like too. No, Jesus was supposed to be an even further revelation of God's character to all of us. Um, and as you know, there was this building that people had built to represent who God was. You know, first we have it in the wilderness with Moses, where they build the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle is the holy of holies, there's the outer courtyard, there's all of these symbols, these practices, these these services that go on there that were supposed to show people the love of God and how God related to us and what God did for us. And, and when Jesus came into Jerusalem and he saw that building that was there to represent his character, it was there to represent his love. And when he walked into it, instead of seeing his love represented, he saw people trying to control each other and cheat each other and trick each other. And he realized that this building had become a symbol of, of, a trick, of a trickster. It had become the symbol of someone out to serve himself, trying to get money from others, to pursue power. It became a symbol of all of the things that we understand that Satan accused God of being and what Satan stood for. And Jesus, rather than, this is not something that Jesus could just let slide. You know, if someone comes and, you know, when people came and hit Jesus, when they mocked him, when they did all of these things, he did not resist. But when people said, you know, actually, you are just a trickster and your father represents all of these bad things that we are doing here. That's when Jesus said, no, that's not who I am. And remember, this is right at the beginning of his ministry. The very first thing he does that everyone probably hears about him is he comes with a whip and he drives out the people who are doing this out of the temple. And he says, my father's house should be a house of prayer um, for all nations. And, and when I look at that, that is the only time in the Bible where I see Jesus doing something that feels to me like violence. And it's not, uh, it's not in defense of somebody else. It's not uh, to, you know, stop someone from hurting himself. Uh, you know, when they come to kill him, he goes meekly. But when they call him, when they make all of the accusations that uh, Satan goes on to make, that the, the whole root of the whole conflict over God's character, that's when, he, that's when he chooses to go up, stand up and do things. And, you know, for me, this, this, uh, this comes down to the end. You know, there are times when we, I think that we also have to speak up. Um, one of the hardest things in life is to stay quiet is, is to have your voice taken away from you and things not to feel just or fair, to not be allowed to answer for yourself. You know, and I, and I realize that these things, like there are, you know, and as I, I guess as you can tell, as I'm getting into this kind of this end of these ideas, I find that these ideas are hard to follow. Um, you know, because what I'm really getting at, it seems that there's a point where we have to speak uh, and it's, uh, it's different from just saying that we don't hurt people, that we're pacifists. It, but there does come a point where, in defense of who we are, we have to speak up at times. You know? And uh, as I start going through the other teachings of Jesus, I think about uh, the things he taught people to do. Um, and ways of speaking up sometimes can be very, very subtle. You know, very, very... So at the time in Israel... A Roman soldier could take anybody and tell them, I want you to carry my pack, which weighed, you know, 50 to 100 pounds, and I need you to pack it for me for one mile. And that is what they could legally force anybody to do, to pack their pack for one mile. And Jesus said, when someone asks you to pack their pack for a mile, pack it for two. Well, if I have the ability to force you 
to do something, and I do it for a mile, and I force you, and I know that I'm forcing you, and you're obeying me because you have to, and you're resentful, and I can, I can assume all of these not very nice reasons why you are obeying me. This little, this little person is obeying me out of fear. They're obeying me because they're a lesser person. But when that person says, you know what? I'm happy to continue helping you. I will keep unpacking it. All of a sudden, that person has made their character clear. They have said, I'm not packing this pack because I'm afraid. I'm packing it out of care for love because I'm representing uh, a God of love. You know? And, and things like this, uh, you know, this is not something that I have easy answers for, but I do know that when, when I... There are times when I, that from now on, I think that when I encounter places where I feel the need to speak out, I'm going to be thinking, like, am I doing this to pursue um, safety? Am I doing this because I'm afraid? Or am I doing this because I don't want to be misunderstood? And I think that that's very important, you know? In all of our lives, we spend our entire lifetime trying to be clear about who we are. We want consistency in our classrooms and stuff because uh, it helps people understand things regularly. Sorry, I see you raise your hand. Sometimes you're speaking out because you know we have that whole bystander effect. Yeah. And you hear people say, you know, to other people, when you see like a hate crime occurring, speak out. Because yeah. if you say something, maybe then people might consider not doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And then someone says something, and you don't agree with it, and you, in your heart, believe it's offensive. But then I think, at what point <coughs> do I just... Because then you think you're just going to have a terrible relationship with that person. <coughs> Because they're going to be like, oh, here comes so-and-so to tell me what I said wasn't appropriate. You know, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like, and then do you say nothing? Because by doing nothing, that's how so many people have been injured and hurt. And like, it's something I struggle with. Where do I speak? Where am I quiet? Do I preserve <laughs> relationship over, hey, that's not right? And so I realized this whole bystander thing and speak up is easy to say, but it's not so easy to practice. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that difficulty is really what I'm getting at today. Like, I, I do find that to be the hardest question. Um, at what point do I speak up and say, you're wrong? <laughs> or, um, you know, and as a teacher, one of the things I've learned is that you can only have so many fights in a day or so many like disagreements with a kid in a day, you know? So, so uh, one of my coworkers always says, pick your battles, Dale. Uh, and uh, at the same time, one of the things this did make clear for me is that if, if somebody comes up and they say something that's offensive and disagreeable with me, um, I don't feel the same need to say you're wrong, but if they come and they say, well, I know that, uh, okay, so a number of years back I was in North Africa and I was meeting a, a, a person for the first time and they said, uh, you're a Christian, eh? I said, yeah. Well, we both hate the Jews. And so they were searching for common ground. And I said, well, that's a point where I couldn't be quiet. You know, there was no amount of, I'm not going to allow them to assume that about me. I have to say, well, a actually, I don't, you know, I have, maybe I have some problems with the political state of Israel, but I don't think there, I don't hate the Jews. And uh, it turned out, but I, I find that I can draw a very murky line between people saying things about me that I have to say, no, that's not actually what I believe and that's not what I stand for. And then people saying things about themselves that I might find um, disagreeable. And with those, I'm probably going to pick my fights. I'm going to say, here's a thing where I feel that our relationship can deal with a discussion. But I don't feel the need to tell someone that they're wrong or that what they're doing is 
wrong every time it happens. In those places, I feel like I, that's where I have more than I should sometimes, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I want to say... Yeah, I want to make sure you guys, I, I really want to open up this discussion because this is kind of where I was hoping this was going is because this really is a hard thing and I, and I feel like I've been wrestling with this for a long time. And so as you guys have, want to share on this topic, I, let's keep on talking. Yes, Brad. Yeah. So I like, oh, I like what you said there. Um, and, and the idea you brought up of, of, uh, of, of uh, now I <laughs> totally slipped my mind again how, how you just worded it. But like, not that you're giving people an out, but you're softening your discussion, you're allowing it to be a discussion of something, and you're giving them an opportunity where it's something that they can grab onto. Um, but, th and this takes me back, there's one other instance in the Bible where where, where people don't give that fig leaf, so to speak, where they don't offer the idea that, oh, this is, uh, we, can, we can debate this. Like, so Jesus goes in and he drives them out and he doesn't say, well, let's talk about if your exchange rates are honest. He says, no, what's going on here is wrong. You're representing who I am in a wrong way and you are hurting all the people who come to the temple. This thing is becoming a tool for evil and it's supposed to be me. You know, so he changes things. The other story that I remember us going over last year um, we have the story of Saul becoming king of the children of Israel. And as a culmination, kind of at the end of all of the different things that he has done to, to change them, to get them the power fixated on him so he can be the kind of king that the neighbor kingdoms are, you know, so that he can have the power that he wants rather than just be the leader that God wants him to be. He goes and they go on the raid on Edom, sorry, not on Edom, on the uh, Ammonites, to the south, and they're supposed to kill um, Hegeta. Is it Edom? Hege, Hegeg, the sub. It's where he doesn't kill the king. He brings the king back in chains, and when Samuel comes to him, Samuel doesn't say, doesn't tell him a story. Samuel just takes that king and kills him. And he says, and, and he's making it very, very clear what Saul is trying to do in, is trying to totally change the entire nature of, the ki of their kingdom and totally turn what they are trying to do as a community and undo everything. And Samuel has no, Samuel has no patience. He has no, I keep thinking the word they always say is like, um, he's not walking quietly around the issue. You know, he's very, very abrupt and says, no, this is, 
when it comes to us relating to each other, we can be very tactful, we can be very careful, we, we always, we have to be. But at times when something is trying to change the whole nature of who we are and who we represent and totally misrepresent us, I feel it is those times that then when we are called to, um, I think as Ellen White says, call sin by its right name. It, yeah. Oh, it's very hard. And some reason, what you're saying there is that at the heart of a lot of these situations is fear. And it's like it's, it's fear because uh, we don't know what to do in those situations. You know, and it's, we, it, uh, it's very hard to simply say, well, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm just going to go say what I think needs to be said. And then you, you are obvious and our logical and our real fear is that we're going to do more damage than good. You know, uh, Rick. see them as promises. When you follow God, you won't do this and you won't do that. And I, and I shared that. I, I said, no, actually you can think of those Ten Commandments as promises. And they kind of look at me like, what? Yeah. You follow God, you won't do this and you won't do that. Um, why I spoke up was in defense of my God. Mm -hmm. But yet at the same time, the Crusaders went off and murdered millions of people in the Middle East in defense of their God. Mm -hmm. um, I think we must have a constant awareness of the Holy Spirit guiding us. What shall we do? Taking that second few seconds to contemplate in prayer what action is any but to just go off as a crusader uh, you could be doing a lot of wrong at the same time yeah Lori yeah. I was just thinking what Renee said it is really hard just a simple thing for me like um, I have one of my best friends he says Jesus all the time as in a slur, not really a swear word, just exasperated or when they're frustrated and things like that. And it has always bothered me when people do that. But I have never yet been able to get up the courage to tell her that bothers me um, and tell her why. Whereas this last couple of weeks, one of my students does it all the time and I had no problem telling my class, I'm like, guys, you know when you say that, it really upsets me because Jesus is my friend. And I feel like you're not using it like you're talking to a friend. You're using it like a swear word. And I explain my feelings. And a couple days ago, <laughs> one of the boys said it again. And the other boy's like, oh, you can't say that. That's Jesus. Uh, that's Mrs. McCurry's friend. <laughs> and I'm like, why can't I just explain it like that to my best friend? But I have never been able to do it yet. So I don't know. It's that fear of her reaction and that I defend her. And I don't know. You know, and I, I don't think we're wrong to be careful about these. I don't think we're wrong to be thinking about these. Like, uh, you know, I've done a series of Bible studies with a young man who was 
in a hard position. And uh, he was asking me questions related to a situation that he was in. And he said, uh, he, he said a situation that was very, very difficult and complex. And he said, can you just tell me that the Bible says that this is wrong? And, uh, and I refused to tell him that. I said, well, the Bible says that you have to, that this is difficult. The Bible says that this is painful. The Bible says that this is damaging. The Bible says that this is sin, which is causing pain and hurt. The Bible doesn't say that you can say that this is wrong, so I'm going to wipe all of these people out of my life. The Bible says that this is hurtful, and so I have to use my wisdom to deal with a difficult situation. And he said, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, um, and I, I think partially that, you know, we're called to make difficult decisions, but I feel like uh, talking with you guys here has made some of these decisions a little bit easier for me. Um, <laughs> at least knowing that everybody finds them difficult. Yes. that God called to do things and say some hard things were not popular people. They were hated. They were they were threatened to be killed. They had to go in hiding. And and I look at that and I think, you know, as a social worker, I never, ever, ever, ever thought in the days that I was sitting in, in, in therapy 
you know, with, with other families coming to me and needing me to just have that poker face and just to listen to them and be, and be affirming and to be validating and to help them walk on their journey. I never thought I'd reach the place where the Word of God teaches us that we need to be like that next Jeremiah, that next Samuel, that next John the Baptist. When we follow Jesus, we take up his cross, which means we're going to be hated. If they did it to him, they're going to do it to us. Mm -hmm. And children are the best, the best ones, like what Brad shared last Sabbath. April was so excited about something she'd learned about the Bible. She was in Sabbath school telling everyone, you know, when Jesus comes, he's not going to touch the ground. He's going to just be in the air. And, and that's how we know it's going to be a false Jesus. If he touches the ground, it's just on Jesus. Like, she was just excited in that childlike way of like, I've heard truth, you guys, listen to this. And I've had my children do the same thing at times where they're just excited about what they're reading and they want to share it and they don't have those same fears that as adults we've either been trained to have or we've been conditioned to have. And I think we can learn from our kids. I think we can learn from how, how honest and open and fearless the children are before they're faced with a few punches they don't have that fear. And, and, and I think that we can learn from that. And for me, I, I'm really working to let go of those fears because the people I'm the most afraid of are often the people that I call my own. And, and that's how it was yeah. for Jesus, you know? The people that, honestly, the people who, who we tend to be afraid of the most are the, one, are the most we feel the most connected to, the most that the people who we feel are part of our family, and that's why it's so scary, because if I lose these people who I call my own, who I'm a part of, yeah. wow, I'm losing a lot. I'm losing yeah. I'm losing my family. I'm losing the people who should love me the most, because I know out there I'm going to be hated, but man, what if I'm hated in here? And that's what we're afraid of, but I really think we can learn from our kids, because our kids, like Jesus said, the children know it's, we must become like a child really afraid of those adult battles that people go into to try to hush each other up and really become more like that child, fearless and just excited about what he's doing in our lives and what we're learning to just speak it so unfiltered. I, you know, I think that uh, I think that there's a, a point where these meet, what you're saying and what I'm saying. Not, uh, so earlier Brad said he liked how I began it with the stories. And when I think about the things that I want for my kids, I want them to be able to think of that story, that Bible story, that experience in their lives, that when they come into a situation where there's a difference of opinions and they need to understand each other, that you know, I really want Matthias and Alexis to, and all of my students to be able to say, well, have you guys ever heard of this? And, and, and to, for, to be able to build the groundwork where, where, where a discussion and can be happening. Um, and I want them to be able to do that fearlessly. <laughs> um, so, you know, so, so find a way to begin things and to be a person that people are never afraid of to start those talks with. And I think I have a really good example that I might close with, and that is, um, um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but we're all wearing masks. Um, and we're living during a pandemic and people have strong opinions on it. And uh, being a person, I have often, throughout my life, I have been a person, like you were saying, Renee, who's gone into this group of people and that group of people, and I've, not so much that I've kept my mouth shut, but I've, but I've been interested in people as I go through different communities, be they very, very conservative communities or very, very liberal-leaning communities or different, where people feel that they can accept me into their community, often without necessarily knowing whether I uh, believe everything they do or not, but they know that I care for them. And so that becomes the, the, the foundation of our relationship. And so when it started to become, you know, mandated that we all wear masks, you know that many people think, uh, great, we're going to do that. And many other people think, horrible, the government's controlling us. And uh, my personal view is that I hate masks, but I'm going to be wearing them to respect people, and I don't want to cause other people to get sick. You know, so, uh, um, you know, so it's, but, but I, what I've noticed is that people who, uh, I'll go into a place wearing a mask, and my friends who don't like masks, who I haven't seen, 
they'll come right up to me and shake my hand and hug me and be like, so good to see you, Dale. And I realize they know, they think that because I am their friend and because of the kind of person they think I am, they assume that I share all of their views. And so I will go into places and people will assume that I think all of the COVID stuff is a conspiracy. And I'll go other places and those friends will assume that I think that everything that is being done is, is really good. And man, those people who aren't wearing their masks or don't want to get their vaccines are just insane. And they will assume that I agree with them. And that's because I care for them and I care for them. And, and, and I found that, uh, and so, so that's sort of the, on the positive side, I'm in all of these communities, but like Renee was saying, on the negative side, am I saying anything? One way or the other. So this, this isn't necessarily even a, a theological issue of right or wrong. But, uh, but I found myself having conversations with people where, again, it began with a, a kind of a story saying, you know, I've seen people be very, very afraid. I've seen people living in lots of fear. And some of my friends who have lots of fear say, the government and corporations are out to get us. And you know what? I'll bet you that the secret is, is that this uh, vaccine has computer chips in it and this and that and it's poison. And, and there's this conspiracy and that is how they deal with their fear. By finding who to blame and then knowing that they are part of the inside people who knows the truth, that's how they deal with their fear. And on the other side, many of my friends who are very fearful say, you know what? The solution to my fear is going to be somebody's going to come and fix it and someone's going to tell me what to do and that's going to make me okay. And so for them, that person becomes public health is going to make them okay. And, and I tell this story to my friends and I say, and for me, what is important to me is that I don't go into this question in fear. You know, I don't, you know, maybe it is a conspiracy, but I'm not going to believe it because I'm afraid and want to be and want to ha know who to blame. Um, personally, I think we should be wearing a mask and listening and doing what we're supposed to be doing, but I'm not going to do it out of fear. And, 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 I, and I find that I'm able to have those conversations because I have those relationships. And so for me, like you were saying, Renee, I think those relationships are very important because they allow us to have conversations. And often those conversations deal with the things that I wanted to be blunt about. Uh, but because my mother and father shared with me Bible stories, shared with me the things they were doing, because they encouraged me to explain myself, I find that I have the ability to deal with many of these situations in a way that might be more fruitful than being super blunt. Um, and I'm definitely not saying that there isn't a time for bluntness, as I've been saying, as we defend our characters, as we defend God's characters, as we, as we th see harm being done that needs to be stopped now. You know, like, and so there's no easy answers, but there's ways that we can get better at it. Yeah. 
I think we're getting to a really big discussion here. And no, no, I, I, I'm like, because I, 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 I realized that if we were to keep this on, I would talk for two or three more hours. I don't want to. But uh, no, as you're saying there, like, we recognize, like, what do we do when the harm is going on around us, when it's being done in God's name, when it feels that we are powerless to stop things? And I, I think that maybe I'll just leave, leave with this. Um, um, in the Bible, we have had a lot of times and periods when people were powerless. And I'm not saying that we're powerless because we have a lot of power and we have a responsibility to use what we have. But we've had times when we've been powerless, when we've gone into slavery, when things have happened, and God has given us hope. God has given us prophecies saying that uh, this too will pass. Um, I think that, uh, and, and so on the one hand, we know that these things will come to an end. But again, that doesn't give us the right to be complacent about it, right? And I think that uh, we also know that uh, the most important way in which we can reflect God's character, the most important way in which we can push away the shadows, the, the twisted reflection of God that is being shown to people, is one, we can try and show what God should be like in our own lives. Um, two, and, and, and we can recognize that our own lives are those that are connected to the people with us in relationship. In other words, we can show it to all of the people that we are around. We can try to be clear about what that means. So we can try to, to um, pursue clarity with people. And, and, I, and I'll say this, like, God could have, at the beginning of creation, he could have written the Ten Commandments and his character on the sky and just left it there. And everyone would have known ever since. But uh, realize that God recognized that just telling people things is not changing them. Requiring things of people is not changing them. What it is is relationship building. And so God spent the entire history of the planet and since building relationships with us and doing things the hard way. And I, and I think that that's uh, what we are called to do. I think the hard way is also the easy way and that it's the only way that works. And that is one person at a time, healing one relationship at a time, telling somebody that there is another God than the one that they are afraid of, one person at a time. And uh, I wanted to go back to something that you said, uh, Deanna. You talked about how um, they will hate you for, like, talking about how it says that the way that they, they, they will persecute you for what you have to say, but there was a, a, a two or three years ago, one of the Lesson Quarterlies was talking about, uh, it was on, on Revelation, and it was talking about all of the different people who were suffering under the, the powers in the world. Um, the beasts or this and that, like the, the oppressive ways in which people are being pushed down and persecuted in God's name, in different names. And, and one of the things the lesson pointed out was that the, the people who are pushing these, the powers, are not the majority of people. It's only a very small minority of, of what is being done in the world is really truly being done to push people down. And, and it is only, in my view, it is only with that minority of people who are truly trying to hurt things that we have to be that blunt. Um, but with the vast majority of people, we can deal with them in wisdom as cunning as serpent, as innocent as doves, as, doves, as it says. And we can both pursue things tactfully and also trust that if we have to be blunt with them then they'll be receptive to that you know so like I think that we have to realize that increasingly in the world it is not only Christians who realize that there is dark forces at work in the world it is people from all minorities it is people from many many different communities who look at the world and say something is not right there is a lack of love and there are actions being done in the name of power and of uh, you know that are hurting people and we need to do something to stop it. And I think that us as a community can only do that one life at a time and encourage and help others to do the same. And I think I want to keep on having these conversations.
<laughs> um, so maybe I'll bring us to a close there. Do you have wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, just that, yeah, echoing what you're saying, because I think it's, I totally agree. And I think that, that that's the place where ultimately the Bible also reminds us is that he's going to fight our battles for us because the battle is spiritual. And for our part, we're to love each other. And that's the, that's, that was the final <coughs> thing where just this morning, Brett and I were having that con- discussion because I was reading something where it said, confront people directly so that you will not be held guilty for the sin. And we were talking about how hard that is. And where Brad finished it was, was later on down in the same chapter, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that ultimately, whether you are bold and speak up or whether you don't, it has to be driven by love. And, and, you know, we hear the story of Jesus, and ultimately, he was consumed with love. He was love. He is love. So even though we see sort of this violent picture of him clearing out the temple, it was righteous anger. It, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a love. It, it was no, there was nothing in it that wasn't love, and I think that's where our anchor has to be in loving each other. And, 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 and that even when we look at those situations like, Jeremiah, Sam, or whatever, they were doing it in love for their nation because even when they were given a chance to leave and go somewhere else and live in peace, they still chose to stay with the people because they loved them and they really were pleading with God to forgive their own people. So when they were rebuking the people, it was out of this this type of love that maybe it, it, it's, it's hard to fully understand. So I think keeping it grounded in love, even when we do have to speak out, keeping that grounded in love and knowing that whatever el- whatever other consequence or punishment or justice needs to be played out, God's going to deliver that better than any of us could. He's going to deliver it with a perfect combination of mercy and justice as he knows that person needs. And, and I know we've seen that in terms of a story um, that when we've experienced that, there's been things that people have done within our life that we know was purely out of hatred, racism, and whatever, and have done big things that we couldn't fight because it was a bigger power. And over time, we've seen, when we heard stories about what happened to those people who were the ones who were leading that charge against us, God, man, God brings forth justice, in ways that we can't. And when it comes to that larger scale injustice of racism and and whatever ever isms of pushing people down out of this this self-righteous form of power, and like you said, Renee, it's still going on and there's still people profiting from what was taken from the people here. In the end, that's what encourages me about reading even Revelation is God's going to balance everything out. He's going to take care of all of that, wherever we're, anyone is sitting in profit over the loss of someone else, God's going to take care of that. Anyway. We don't need to fight that. He's going to take care of all of it in a perfect combination of mercy and love that we can't deliver. Thank you. Um, let's bow our heads. Can I just share oh, a verse? Sure. Reading this. It says, You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle in your hearts not to meditate beforehand what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth of wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. So don't be afraid when you have to speak. Yeah. You feel the need to and speak. they don't have to worry, stress out beforehand. Mm-hmm. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, you know that a lot of the situations we find ourselves in life can be incredibly difficult. And you know that you know, even after we feel we spend our lives preparing to deal with people and doing it, that life is tricky and, and difficult. But we know the work that you did to make clear to us your reputation, your character. And as a result of that, we know that we can trust you And we ask that you help us reflect that and give us the wisdom to do that. Give us the wisdom to to be who we want to be and to to 
understand how to reach people in a way that allows them to change or allows us to help in situations that are difficult. Um, we ask you to be with us in this every day for the rest of our lives since it never stops being hard. In your name we pray, amen. Now, I just um, wanted to let you guys know, um, I did ask David to record this. So a lot of people shared a lot of things that were kind of personal. So if you guys would rather I not share this, just let me know afterwards, okay? And that's fine. Um, otherwise, otherwise, I'm probably going to share this with some friends. All right.